want to start off with a little metaphor for you relating to what I talked about last week to kind of ease us back into this idea. So I thought of this metaphor of cake, not the band, sorry. Um, so I want you to tell me this. Say there is a When you see those two words, what's the difference between those two words for you? What's the difference between a cook and a chef? Chefs wear hats. Okay, right here, chefs wear hats. A chef is more likely to be French. A chef is more likely to be French, okay. But chef is more of the boss than the cook would be. Okay, chef is more the boss than the cook would be? Yeah. Chef might be coming up with something new, whereas a cook's just sort of making from a recipe. Okay, the chef's coming up with something new where the, the cook's working for, from a recipe in the back there. Uh, when I think of chef, I think of someone with the formal training. Formal training, yeah. Is that was yours too? Yeah. The cook is somebody got hired on to do a job, whereas the chef is like, I went and I trained and I am a chef. Um, so I want you guys to be chefs. And I really like the, whoever it was that said, the chef comes up with something new. The cook follows instructions. Now, this is an issue from what I talked about last week. This idea that your job as a writer is to not be a cook, but to be a chef. The chef looks at the ingredients and says, I know what happens when I combine these two ingredients. And if I combine them in a different and interesting way, I will create something new. And I'll try that out. I'll see how it is. It may not work. It might work but I'm going to experiment with it. The cook says, well, this tool goes in this spot. So I use this tool. Um, great example of this is the hero's journey. Hero's journey is a great tool. You guys familiar with the hero's journey? Uh, Joseph Campbell's monomyth. It's this thing you study. Um, we'll talk about it in the class off and on. Uh, but it's this idea that there's a young protagonist who goes on a quest and there's kind of things along the, the route that most of them run into. You're wearing a Star Wars hat. Star Wars was the hero's journey. Uh, it goes back to classical Greek uh, stories. This idea of you know, the mentor figure, the descent into the underworld or to the belly of the whale. Um, and then the, at the end, the, the hero comes back and shares what he or she has learned. Usually it was he in the past. With, um, with the people where he came from, right? So the hero's journey, it's actually a great model for looking at the story. The chef would look at this and say, ah, this is describing storytelling externally. This is describing how these tools have been applied in the past. And I can now look at and see why the, the protagonist having a mentor makes such an interesting part of the story. The cook says, well, here are the list of things that are on the hero's journey. I will apply each of those to my story. So don't want to go into it too much. The poor man's been, uh, been uh, had criticism heaped upon him. But the virgin birth. The virgin birth is a part of the hero's journey. So George Lucas put the virgin birth into Star Wars in the prequels. Uh, if you haven't seen them, then you're lucky. But... <laughs> There is this moment where Anakin's mother says, there was no father, virgin birth. Now, I'm convinced that George Lucas put this in to follow the checklist of the things that are on the hero's journey. Every person I know that watched that at that moment said, what? This doesn't fit the mythology that you've presented to us. It doesn't, doesn't match. It doesn't add anything to the story. It's just there in this weird sort of way. This is a perfect example. In fact, uh, again, not to heap too much on George Lucas because we all do this. We all occasionally say, well, I've learned this tool. This has to happen. Uh, the mentor has to die, so I'll kill the mentor right now. If that's why you're doing it, then you're missing something. If instead you say, okay, um, if I separate the, the protagonist from the mentor at this point, um, the arc that I've already built means that the protagonist now can stand on their own, can prove that they can stand on their own, even though all along they didn't think that they could, and then they have this moment to achieve something by themselves without the training wheels on. That is a great moment for this specific character's arc because I have referenced it all the way through and built to this point. That makes a great moment in a story. Just doing something because it's part of the checklist does not. 
I bring this up because we're going to talk a lot in the class about things that can feel like a checklist. We're going to talk about formulas. We're going to talk about three-act formula when we do uh, plotting. We're going to talk about you know, how Hollywood constructs a story, how this person constructs a story. Today we'll talk about characters. I'll talk about here are some things I've noticed that make a character sympathetic. The point is not to say to you, here's a checklist to use. The point is to get you thinking about the why. Why does this work for, for this character? Why does this make a character feel sympathetic? And how can I adapt that to the stories in the way I want to use them? All right? Um, kind of the preface for the whole class is this idea of um, what makes up a story. Let me, let me ask you that. What makes something a story? What, What's a what is a story? Pretty open-ended question. We're going to take an entire semester to answer it, but let me ask you. Conflict. Okay, conflict is a story. Um, that's kind of one of the classic definitions of it, right? Um, you know, the, the king died, the queen died is not a story. Isn't that how it goes? But the king died and the queen died of grief is a story because one implies an actual conflict, whereas one is just a sequence of events. Yeah, what, what else? Any ideas what one makes a story? Character growth. Character growth? Okay, something changing. I would say that's definitely a big part of it. Um, uh, character growing is a good, ask, uh, a good example of something changing, and the best stories tend to have the character be someone different. Even if they return to the same place, like the hero's journey says, it's a different person from who left. Yeah. Preferably interesting characters doing interesting things. Interesting characters doing interesting things. Yes, that, that is one thing I look forward to as, as aspects of a story. I'm um, obviously like a sequence of events and descriptions that importantly makes people care. Okay. Beings care about you know, Yeah, sequence of events and characters that make the reader care. Definitely. Definitely. Um, as I've tried to divide this out in my head, I've kind of come up with, these are the, these are the parts of the story. Um, the parts of the story are really plot, setting, and character. And then there's this idea of conflict that ties them all together. Um, that's how I've started viewing it. Uh, a story is a character at odds with their setting or characters at odds with other characters, or even themselves, or characters at odds with what the world seems to think that they should do, um, or what the, the, the plot of the book necessarily is. Um, this is what makes a setting. Now, the box, four circles in a box, is there is this box around this, and this is the structure. I'm not talking about the plot structure. I'm talking about the things like your viewpoint intents, um, your tone, your paragraphing, how you build your chapters, all of these things. Uh, I view these as kind of the, the window through which you're going to see the story, uh, your own personal voice, uh, all of this kind of stuff that are the decisions you make about how to tell this story about a character in a certain place doing a certain thing. At odds, hopefully, with all three of them. So in this class, my goal is to take each of these chunks and spend a couple weeks on them. Today, we're going to start with character. Uh, but we'll have probably, usually, during a year, you can tell I usually kind of feel out as I'm going how I run these lectures. It's not always, I don't have a strict le lecture set, but usually I, I end up doing two weeks on character, two weeks on plot, two weeks on setting, and in each of those I'm talking about conflict, and then we'll do usually about two weeks on the box. We'll talk about viewpoint intense. Um, we'll talk about you know, picking your tone, your paragraphing, your prose, all of those sorts of things. So today, we're gonna talk about character. We're gonna talk about character sliders. Um, and this will be the biggest chunk of what we do today. Yes, the character sliders. So, character. It's interesting to think about those three boxes, or those three circles. Because if you consider, we're in a science fiction and fantasy writing class. That's what this is focused on. So you would assume that the setting is the most important part. 
right? That's what drew us to this class in specific. But we have this weird situation in sci-fi fantasy where, in my opinion, mo you can have the most interesting setting ever, but if it, isn't, it doesn't have interesting characters to populate it, it's actually going to be a boring story, right? Um, now, plot is a, is, a, is a different beast. There are plenty of books with boring characters and exciting plots that work just fine. But I can't think of very many book-length works that have a really fascinating setting, but bad characters that I enjoyed. So there's this catch-22. Ideally, I want to teach you in such a way that you can do all three of those circles well, and then you can choose the box that you enjoy most that naturally matches your writing style um, the best to tell that story in a way that achieves your goals. That's what I want, so that all three will be equal. Realistically, though, if you're going to skimp, or if you're, you're going to fail on any of them, don't fail on character, okay? Um, I have read books where I'm like, you know what, the setting, it's only so-so, but I love these characters, and I finished that book. Now, this is a personal thing. It's entirely possible that you may have a different opinion on this, but I really think that character it rules the roost of those three. And having interesting people is important. If you can think about it, we often talk in um, writing classes about starting with a bang, right? You're like, I need, you need to start with a hook. You need to start with a great scene that draws the reader in. Anyone heard these sorts of things in writing classes or in English classes before? Um, most of you have. And then a lot of writer, writers think, okay, I need to start with an action sequence, which is not necessarily a bad way to start. But then they include that lots of action and fighting and people dying and heads getting chopped off and people thrown out of windows and are surprised when their reader finds that intro kind of boring. They say, but heads got chopped off. People got defenestrated, right? <laughs> Literally defenestrated. Um, this is exciting, isn't it? Well, the re writer will find out often that they didn't give enough character and people dying... <sighs> You know, action, particularly in a book, it's not, books are not like Jackie Chan films, right? I can watch Jackie Chan punch people for an hour and a half, and I'm okay with that, right? <laughs> Jackie's going to find some different things to punch people with. Uh, you know, he's going to use their own fists at points. He'll use, you know, someone's hair. He will throw them off a cliff. Yeah. Okay, you argue that, like, Jackie Chan is a great character. Ja Jackie Chan is a great character. He is. Um, and that, that's, that's the thing is Jackie Chan doesn't consider himself a martial artist as much as a physical comedian who does martial arts. Um, but the thing is, in a book that blow by blow, if you wrote, he punched him, he punched him really hard. He grabbed the chair and hit him. It just is boring. Um, and beyond that, if the people who are getting hurt are not people with whom you empathize, you're gonna, that's gonna run thin really quickly. Now, that doesn't mean you can't start with a bang with people you don't know, but you gotta be sparing. If you're gonna start off with a 20-page battle scene, you're gonna have readers be bored even if it's the most exciting scene ever. However, you can have a scene that starts with no action, but is a really intense character moment that readers will love um, and will draw them in. It will be a much better hook then your action sequence. So kind of discard this thing um, you've been taught about starting with a bang and start thinking about that idea of the hook. The why, okay? The why. When I was in high school, we got taught about hooks from my English teacher. Said you need to hook your audience quickly and efficiently with something that will grab their attention. And then so we all did essays. We wrote them. And then we presented in the class. And one person got up and said, sex, 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 sex. Now that I have your attention, let's talk about race relations. <laughs> that was their hook. That's what I want you to avoid. <laughs> right? <laughs> Ask yourself with your hook you're planning, is this sex, 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 sex? Race relations in the 1950s and the, 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 right? Um, you want your hook to be something that introduces the idea of your story in a concise, interesting way that encapsulates the kinds of emotions, not every one of them, but the kinds of emotions and tone you are going to give this reader by reading this book. This is what we call making promises. 
right? Making promises of tone very early. One of those promises you can give people is an interesting and engaging character. Um, I believe it was Kurt Vonnegut who said, start a story with somebody who wants something really badly, even if it's just a glass of water, which I really want right now. A character who wants something. So as I've thought about this, um, I've thought a lot about what makes a character work, what makes a character interesting. So let's, let me ask this. What makes a character interesting? What makes a character interesting to you? Yes? They can do really cool things. OK, they can do really cool things. That's great. What, what, else, what else makes a character interesting to you? Uh, conflicted morals. Conflicted morals. I'm actually going to write some of these up. These are good ones. OK, cool things. Cool. Conflicted. All right, what else we got? Yeah. Out of their depth. Out of their depth. OK. That's great. All right, let's go right here. Characters' relationships with other people. OK, relationships. Relationships, great. All right, well, what else we got? Yeah. Contrasting against stereotypes. OK, contrasting against stereotypes and? Um, they seem real or they're right with myself. OK, OK. So they contrast. Stereotypes. Uh, remind you of yourself. All right. Yeah, this is great. Over here in the yellow scarf. Your character takes action. Takes action. Character takes action. All right. Proactive. All right. Yeah, right here. Um, when they have a flaw. Okay. When they're flawed, they're not perfect. Great. Um, when they have a defining moment. Okay, okay. That they think about often, but they don't tell you what that defining moment necessarily is, but reveal it throughout the story. Okay, so you're talking about a past. A powerful past. They're not just a character who starts on page one and is a, has never had a life before that, um, but there are things in their past that have shaped who they are. I like when they're funny. Oh, you like when they're funny. Okay, good. Okay. Yeah. Um, extremely sympathetic or extremely sympathetic. <clears throat> okay, okay. Or not. All right, let's do one more. Who else has one? Yeah. They're affected by the world around them. Okay. Yeah. Interconnected. This is a pretty darn good list, I would say. You could almost write this all down um, and then say, OK, we're done for today. But this might stray into being the chef type of, of stuff. Um, this, is, this is a great list. The question you want to be asking yourself is, how do I do this? Why are these things compelling? Um, what's interesting about them? So early in my career, I started to think about characters. And one of the things I realized is that characters kind of exist on this sort of this timeline. This was my kind of first attempt to describe character. Um, it's not necessarily the model that I think encapsulates everything, but it was useful for me as a new writer. And this timeline was bet between what I called the everyman and the superman, or woman. Uh, everyman and superman, right? The idea being that uh, we like characters often because they remind us of ourselves, all right? This is one of the major sources of sympathy for characters. So we're talking about, right here, how to make characters sympathetic, really, or readable. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, though, we find that readers really connect with characters who are hyper-competent. This competency sort of drives uh, interest in a lot of different characters. In fact, um, oftentimes if there's a character who's not very much like us, they are made hyper-competent as a method of making them very interesting and sympathetic to us even if they aren't much like us. The BBC Sherlock is a great example of this. Uh, Sherlock is presented as not very much of an everyman at all. 
um, but he is presented as hyper-competent. He is given an everyman companion in that show in order to balance the fact that he is so Superman. And in fact, they take great pains to make Watson very everyman-like in that show, much beyond the actual originals, if you've read Sherlock Holmes. Uh, he is just way more normal. He's not as bumbling as some of the Watsons have been, but he's a little bit bumbling. He, but he's also very grounded. They try very hard to make him feel like an everyman. So a lot of the stories, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, just to clarify. So the idea that Watson fulfills the everyman role doesn't mean that he's not competent at things, but it's not the things that would make him superhuman at the tasks that need to be performed in this marriage. Yeah, you could say that. You could definitely say that. You could, you could say that where Watson is competent is that he's competent at being a human, a good person. <laughs> he's competent at all the things that Holmes is not competent at. You also see this in um, Lord of the Rings. Another great example of this is Sam. Sam, um, was, that, was that a cheer for Sam, Samwise? <laughs> so uh, Tolkien himself, and this is um, said that he considered Sam to be the hero of the Lord of the Rings. Um, most readership polls list Sam as their favorite character. Um, Sam is competent, but he's really only competent in one thing, and that's really being a good friend. Now, he is hyper-competent at being a good friend. He is extremely loyal, but in most ways he is there as to, to kind of fulfill this role of... Um, Tolkien was a, a Beowulf scholar. He tra did a translation of Beowulf, and there are writings where he implies that the whole idea behind The Hobbit in the first place was to put a normal person in the role of one of these heroes from an ancient epic, right? Beowulf goes and, you know, slays a dragon. There's actually a scene where someone steals a cup from a dragon in Beowulf. Um, there's all these sort of, you know, this great journey and fighting, and he wanted to do uh, kind of a normal um, British dude who got thrown into Beowulf, Right? And that's kind of our Sam, to a lesser extent our, our Frodo, but Sam in this. Um, but those books also have characters over here on this end of the spectrum. Uh, Aragorn, y y you never really question whether Aragorn can slay the 50 orcs that he needs to slay. In fact, if you read the books, Tolkien's like, and yeah, and Aragorn took care of those 50 orcs. Because he just can, right? <laughs> He's Aragorn. Um, in fact, if you, if you watch the movies and read the books, they had to kind of move Aragorn for the films this direction a little bit, give him an internal conflict, make him unsure if he wanted to be king, in order to ground him a little bit more um, and kind of build some more of the everyman sympathy because he was on this edge of the spectrum so far in the screenwriter's opinion. I don't know if that's right or wrong. Your Tolkien-esque senses can decide whether you think that was a right move or not, but that's what they did. So it, the story of that is Sam in the world of, of Superman. Um, and I'll get to this question in just a second. Um, the other thing I, about this scale, again, this doesn't cover everything, but it was really interesting to me as I thought about it is that a lot of stories are about moving up this line, right? Um, Spider-Man as a hero or the classic hero's journey, Luke Skywalker, uh, whoever it is, um, many of the stories are about going like this. You could even argue that um, there are a lot of books about manners, where the main character, her, the protagonist, her job is moving from the outsider who doesn't understand high society to the person who understands it and becomes a master of it. This is one of the things that we like as, a, as an arc is we establish a character that we like and then we push them toward this to the point that by the end they are dominant in their field, whatever it is. Uh, what was your question yeah, over sorry. there? Mine is more of a clarification. So it's not yeah. so much a scale of ability like Every man isn't good at anything, but Superman are good at everything. It's more the every man is the person that everyone can connect to very quickly. Yes. Superman is where the so you're, you're yeah. sympathetic of him because he's so different. Right, right, right. It's not necessarily a scale of competence on this one. Um, what it more like is this is the person we want to be like. This is the person we see ourselves as. All right. Moving from the person we see ourselves as to the person that we would like to be be like. That's not to say that you're going to read a book about James Bond and be like, I want to be James Bond, necessarily. But that's kind of the theme. James Bond was one of these supermen. Um, James Bond was good at everything. And this was more common in older days than it is now. You don't see a lot of contemporary stories. You still see some. Dirk Pitt is like this. Has anyone read the Dirk Pitt books? Uh, Dirk Pitt, Clive Klessler, they're very popular. Um, I read one 
where I swear to you, like, like he is, Dirk Pitt is just awesome. He does everything awesomely. Um, and that's okay, because you want to read about Dirk Pitt. He's even a really nice person. So it's not, he's not even a jerk like, uh, like James Bond, right? He's just a great person, and he's so awesome that everyone around him becomes awesome by association. I, I remember one book, it's been a while, but I'm pretty sure like, his accountant was trapped on an island by himself with terrorists and thought, what would Dirk Pitt do? <laughs> and went and got himself a bazooka, blew a helicopter out of the air, armed himself and killed all the terrorists because he knew Dirk Pitt and knew what Dirk would do and he was able to do it even though he was the accountant because, you know, Dirk Pitt, right? Um, these books still can be successful, um, but you don't see as many of them anymore. If you read, read Golden Age comics and compare them to Modern Age comics, you'll see that uh, What's going on here is that there's a, a lot more movement um, along the scale. But it's really, what do you want to be like? How do you see yourself? Now, as I said, I don't really, I think this is a, is a fun model. It was useful for me for a number of years. Um, and maybe it'll be useful to you. I've instead recently started to look at characters as a group of sliding scales. Uh, again, not necessarily as a checklist, but as trying to analyze why some work and some don't. I should make the caveat that when I'm writing books, I'm usually not thinking about most of the things I will write on this board. When I'm designing a book, I often will be thinking about them. When I run into a problem in a book, the tools I write up on the board are usually the things that I step back and say, OK, let's analyze this. Let's see what's not working. Let's try and figure out why this is not working. So these are usually tools I'm not necessarily in the moment of writing. I've done this so long that I've started to do a lot of this by instinct. This is me trying to explain what's going on inside my brain. Um, so this is mine, but we will do a, uh, talk about a few other people's that I've met, their methods of building characters. So this, there are lots of ways to do this. But I started looking at characters as kind of these sliding scales um, that you can kind of imagine. You can come up with your own. Um, but you, you can imagine one of them being competence, another being likability and another being proactivity. And there are plenty of others. Um, this isn't going to be talking necessarily about how funny the character is, which would be another you know, sliding scale or, or things like this. But I kind of look personally at three things driving, three major forces driving what makes a character interesting for us to read about. One is this competence. We talked about that. Someone who is very competent and capable is interesting to us. Now, the reason I like this better than that other scale is because you can have competence in a limited area. You can say Samwise Gamgee is the most loyal person in, 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 in anything. And you can say his competency in a really narrow band is pretty high. Compared to everyone else in the world, he's way down here because he's only good at one thing, whereas Aragorn's good at almost everything. But you can, you can kind of look at that. Likeability is just how naturally nice, how much, how much they remind us of ourselves. It's a little bit like that everyman quality. But it's also, you know, are they a good person? Um, do we want to read more about this person? Uh, do they have friends? One of the easiest and quickest ways to make someone likable um, in a story is to have another character talk about why they like them. Now, this can stray into being sappy, so be dangerous, right? You, if, you, if you start up your book and it, there's like 40 different people being like, wow, I wish I could be like Sally. She is the best. Have you seen her throw throwing stars? Best at throwing stars. And the next person's like, yes. And Sally also is really good at kicking people in the face. I don't know. You, just, you, <laughs> you, you could see how this would get annoying. But if you introduce this as a, um, a person, who is, who just, you know, they interact with their characters and those characters like them, we will naturally be more sympathetic toward that person. In Hollywood terms, they say if you want someone, the audience to like someone, have them pet a dog. If you don't want them to like that person, have that same person kick a dog. That's, again, a cliche. This is not, this is, but this is a tool to kind of dig out and say, okay, what does that mean? Um, what's going to make us like a character? So likability. Uh, finally, proactivity. We really, really naturally like people who move the story along. And we get really frustrated by characters who refuse to move the story along. 
Now, when we talk about plotting, we'll talk about this idea that progress in a book is illusionary. All movement through a story is at, in your control as the author. And the reader kind of knows this. So they know that when that character is just not going anywhere, when they're stuck in the same rut that they've been in for four or five chapters, it feels like an eternity to the reader because they're like, just come on. You can do this. You can get beyond it. You can change something. We like characters that are proactive. Now, what this does is, um, when I was thinking about this, is you can kind of move people up and down on the scale to create, by, by create, taking these three, you can create different styles of characters and think about why they work and why they don't. For instance, if you have someone who's very proactive and very competent but not likable at all, can you think of any characters who are like that? What's that? Ray, raise your hand. Give me one. Yeah, in the back. Sherlock. Okay, Sherlock is an awesome example. We've already talked about him, yeah. Umbridge. Okay, Umbridge, Umbridge, yes. <laughs> Umbridge, <laughs> very much so, yeah. Gru. Okay, Gru. Okay, I would say that Gru is supposed to be unlikable, but, he's actually but you actually do, but you're right. That's exactly like, I think Gru's arc is, is that you think he's this, this, you think he's this exactly, and Gru through a despicable me, what it really means is, through the course of the story, you realize he's really here and actually here, <laughs> but still pretty proactive, right? Um, and that's, that's a fun reversal. That movie works because he looks all awesome, but you're like, you know what? You're really kind of a has-been, but you're also really, really likable. We like you. You're nice to your minions most of the time, um, you know, and, and things like that. But yeah, that's, that's perfect. That's exactly. Um, but I would say that a lot of um, our, your classic villains um, are like that. They are hyper-competent or at least hyper-proactive, um, but not very likable. Uh, this leads to, by the way, the thing that I've talked about on writing excuses before, what we call the villain problem, where in a, a lot of stories with dynamic villains, the villains are the main source of proactivity in the story. Uh, and you, if you look at a lot of the Hollywood blockbusters are a good example of this, just because they're so translucent uh, or transparent, I mean, with, their, with the way that they're approaching storytelling. The villain is this dynamic. It's Loki, right? Yeah. Loki is like trying to do stuff. What is Thor trying to do? I want to drink and maybe throw my hammer at some people. Um, <laughs> if that's all he really wants out of life, Loki has aspirations. And the entire, all the whole thing moves because Loki does stuff. This creates this thing where uh, the majority of people like Loki as a character more than they like Thor, right? Um, because he is proactive. And even though he's kind of despi despicable, he's proactive and moderately competent. We, he drives the story. We end up liking him. So your challenge as a writer writing particularly this type of story, but really anything where you're going to have a dynamic antagonist, is to keep this in mind. How are you going to make sure that your main character is proactive? This is difficult. And I want to take a moment to talk about making your, act, your character proactive. Because you might be thinking, OK, I'm going to start this story um, with a character who doesn't really want, you know, their arc is learning to step up and you know, kind of take control of their own life and to be proactive. How do I write a story about a character who does that they naturally have to have a low proactivity bar at the beginning. Well, what can you do? What can you do to make a character proactive at the start, even if they aren't going to be the main driving force of the plot in the first third? Small dreams. Okay, small dreams. Small dreams, like what? Uh, I want a specific magic card. I want a specific magic card. Ah, after my own heart, yes. Uh, go ahead. Okay, forcing their hand very early is a great way to do it. When we talk about plotting, we'll talk about three-act format. It's one of the things, which is act one, the character doesn't want to have to do anything, but they are quickly forced beyond it. Yeah? I think some books kind of have like a false plot that carries you through the beginning, and then the real plot is revealed throughout the book. And then... Yeah, yeah, the, the little small plot in the first, you know, you can kind of look at the first third, or the first half, the first third, the first sixth, to be this thing where you're like, we're going to do something. The character actually wants something. Um, and we're going to show them wanting it while we reveal the main plot. Yeah, in the back. It can also be like uh, Bilbo Baggins in The Hobbit, 
where they start off where they're like, I just want to sit on my porch smoking every day, but then suddenly adventure breathes and I, maybe I do want. Yes, that's a really good way to do it. You've got two good things in here, and I'll get to your, yours in a second. There's two good things in here. I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. Let me, let me, the first one is to give an indication that even though the character thinks their life is per perfect, something is missing. Or to give an indication that, you know what, there's a big world out there and the character would like to explore it deep in their heart. That's that moment in the original Star Wars where Luke Skywalker stands up on the, the hill, is it? And you see the two sons and he, sons and he looks out. And there's that moment of, he longs for something, um, right? You can give this indication that the character isn't satisfied, even though they don't quite know how to be proactive in their life yet, that they, there is something missing. There is something they want. The other thing you can do is you can make the thing that they want be stability and not give that to them from page one, right? We don't read The Hobbit and have like 50 pages of Bilbo living a perfect life. Um, we read The Hobbit and very quickly, dwarves show up on his doorstep and ruin his perfect life. So at least, you know, we know what he wants. So there's this idea of you can show the character's desires even if they can't really be proactive yet. Um, let me go to the people who had other suggestions because I do want to, we'll, we'll hop to you and then the, there was somebody over here who had one. Yeah, right there. So right here. You can give them small things to be proactive about. So choices that they make very well and they want that and they get it, but it's very small things. Yeah. And they, so it shows them that they can be proactive. Right. You, you show with small things they can be proactive, even if they're stuck in a rut in the main part of their life. Um, then you can show that there are things they can work on. Um, I recently read uh, the first book of The Expanse, uh, Leviathan Wakes. Um, which has a character who is stuck in a rut in their life. Um, actually, both main characters are kind of in ruts, but is showing their, in their everyday lives the things that they do, and they're making decisions. And then big events happen that shake them out of their comfortable life, but we have already seen them doing things and wanting things, even if they were in a rut. So it works very well. Yeah. Um, remember their uh, proactive the desire to move forward. Yeah. Their confidence. Yes, yeah. They're, they want to move, but they can't. Yeah. What you really want to avoid, like, if, okay, they can't be proactive, you probably want to try showing them being competent in at least one sphere. Uh, let's talk about the competence one for a little while. Um, a more contemporary way, contemporary way of looking at it is not that characters are hyper competent or are hyper incompetent. Really it is, characters, we're all competent in certain areas, and what a book might do is force us out of our area of competence and force us to learn new competencies, or to learn to apply what we are good at to the world at large. Um, you can probably think of many stories where the character is good at one thing in their normal life. The, um, the one that comes to mind is Legally Blonde, all right? <laughs> Uh, in Legally Blonde, she wins the big court case by knowing how to take care of hair products, right? How to take care of a perm. That's like, you know, the, uh, you can show someone being hyper-competent in one area, move them outside of their area of competence, but then show how they adapt and learn to use their old competence in their new life. This is a very good way to show someone kind of that is competent and incompetent at the same time. Is the idea that, like, we forgive people for not being competent as long as they're trying? We do forgive, though, that's the proactivity. Um, and you can, you can actually, let's, let's talk about this for a minute. You can probably, let's see, is there somebody who's highly proactive but highly incompetent that you can think of that's a good character? Solo. Han Solo? Megamind. Megamind. Um, I, would, I would say, yeah. Uh, who else? Just, yeah, Megamind's a great example. Smeagol. Smeagol, okay. Yeah, yeah, he's trying to do stuff, definitely. <laughs> What's that? Wiley Coyote, oh, that's the perfect example of somebody who is really, really proactive and hyper incompetent, right? Um, and so, so there can be, you can write characters who are just not very competent but trying very hard. And that's what you're talking about. The person who tries hard will get huge points from us. I remember reading an essay about the opening of Indiana Jones, the first one. And if you remember this, uh, this Indiana Jones, 
Indiana Jones goes into this cave. They has to like face spiders to get stuck on people's backs and get over a pit. And there's like traps and spears. And then finally, that famous scene where he like gets the idol and puts like the bag on, and the ball rolls after him, and he runs. And at the end of that, Indiana Jones loses. Right? Indiana Jones is not competent enough to succeed despite everything we've gone through. Now, I'm not going to argue that Indiana Jones is incompetent. He's not. But they make great pains to show Indiana Jones kind of being right there. He is hyper proactive, right? Indiana Jones does not sit around. Indiana Jones goes and does stuff, even when it's stupid to do so. <laughs> and he's just competent enough to get himself out of troubles, but not generally presented as competent as a lot of the people around him. But we love him because of how hard he tries. And in some ways, we start getting into this idea of, of a character being flawed, which we'll talk about next. Um, yeah. Sorry to keep jumping, but about that, so possibly like lowering the level of confidence helps raise the stakes. Yeah, definitely. Lowering confidence raises stakes. Yeah. And like gives you some, because like that's the thing about the is like you always felt like he was a major, right? Yeah, you always feel like he's one step away from catastrophe. Um, and that raises the tension and the conflict. Now, the question you have to ask yourself is, what type of story am I telling? Okay? Um, am I telling a story where I want the reader to feel that the character is always one step away from catastrophe? That's a certain type of story. It's this fish out of water story. Who mentioned that one? Um, out of their depth. It's that sort of story is a character whose competence does not match the competence required but their proactivity is high enough that they compensate for it, right? Um, they just try so hard. It's this idea of you try 99 times and fail, but the 100th time you succeed. That is an out-of-your-depth type story. That's a great story to tell. However, there are plenty of stories that people tell about hyper-competent people that you never really believe are going to fail. Um, a lot of the classic James Bond stories are like this. Hyper-competent you know he's going to succeed. You just know. A lot of the classic Superman stories are like this too. He is going to succeed. Um, and there are plenty of stories that you read where this extremely competent character, it, you know they're going to navigate this world pretty well, and it's fun to simply watch how great they are at it. In another type of genre, the heist genre, anyone seen the movies Ocean's Eleven? You never really doubt that Danny Ocean is smooth and knows exactly what he's doing. He is not out of his depth, um, but it is fun to watch someone extremely competent go about doing awesome things. That's a type of story. Those are two different stories. Your job is to decide what is my story going to do and what kind of emotion do I want to evoke from the reader? What kind of tension do I want to have in my story? So, competence. I would suggest that as you look at competence, you kind of have two or three scales here. One is their general competence and fluency in the situation that they're in. And the other is this idea of what are they good at? Everybody should be good at something in your stories. Whether it's simply being loyal or whether it's at singing a cappella really well. Okay? Everyone should be good at something even if it doesn't relate to the main plot of your story, all right? So likability. Likability is this kind of middle of the road one um, where the other two will naturally bump this one up the higher you move those on the scale. So if you want them to be unlikable and they're competent and proactive, you need to try and drag them down on the scale by you know, having them burn down a city or something like that. Um, not necessarily have to do that. Uh, but a good way to do that, if you want to pull someone down on likability, is to make them the cause of the obstruction that the protagonist is suffering from, right? Um, if, you want, if you want a character who, you know, she moves to a new school and she's feeling like she's out of, um, you know, from her comfort zone and everything is uncertain, she's kind of like, oh man, my life has been upended. I knew everything back home. Here, I don't know what's going on. You can easily make a villain or an antagonist in this story by presenting a character who exacerbates that, right? Who makes them feel more like an outsider. Who makes whatever flaw or handicap 
or conflict they're dealing with worse. As soon as you do that, that person will be presented as an antagonist in the character's mind. It'll move that person down on the likability, and it'll move your character up a bit. We like people who struggle with constraints. Flawed characters are actually generally pretty likable to us, if you do it right. Um, handicapped characters are even more likable, if you do it right. Now, there is a difference between a flaw and a handicap. Someone who has not watched my lectures, um, have any guesses? Like, what, is, what do I mean by distinguishing a flaw and a handicap? Yeah? Because writing excuses counts. Writing excuses counts, yeah. Anyway, what do you got? So someone with a handicap cannot overcome their whatever blocking them? Yes. A person with a flaw, like, whether they can't see it or they're too proud to look beyond it, and so they're stuck, but not because they have to. Yeah, yeah, I, that's it exactly. I would imagine, in a story, at least for I to find myself, the distinct, there's a handicap. The story is not about getting rid of the handicap. A handicap is something you do have to overcome, something you have to live with and work with, but it is not something that the story kind of presents as, boy, this character needs to get over this. This is a problem of the character's own devising, that if they would just get beyond this, life would be better. Um, a flaw is the reverse. A flaw is, this is the character's fault, and it's presented in such a way that I will expect either the character to work on and learn from this thing, or I will expect it to cause them serious trouble through the course of their story, um, to the point that it could be the disaster that ruins them in the end. Um, so, we, you know, when I say handicap, you probably think of natural handicaps, such as, you know, missing one hand, um, or, or being blind, or something like this. But there are all sorts of things that can be handicaps that aren't necessarily you know, that the character has to work with but are not necessarily physical limitations. For instance, having a code of ethics can be looked at as a handicap compared to other characters. Um, a lot of comic books like to do this, the, he will not kill. That's a handicap, right? Um, so, I mean, Batman, he'll run people over with his car, he'll stick them in the legs, he'll, you know, he'll, he'll do, but he won't kill them. Um, but it, it's, it, it's silly, but it is a handicap, right? Um, you can look at these other things that a character having um, a family that they care about, that they don't want to get into danger, the family is a handicap. We as readers do not want them to get over having a family. We like that they have a family. This is important to them and to us. It is a handicap. It is something the character will work with, but will not necessarily get rid of. Flaws are things like this character is arrogant, shy, whatever it is that you want your character arc to be. These sorts of things make characters sympathetic to us because they, it brings them into that sort of they're like us. If they have, they have flaws that are like us or handicaps that we deal with, we like them. Even if they're maybe a little ridiculous. Like, for instance, I live with my evil aunt and uncle who buy a hundred presents for my nephew but none for me and make me live in the closet under the stairs <laughs> where there are spiders. Um, right? The, the handicaps on top, piled on top of him are pretty high, and that entire opening sequence in Harry Potter is all about proving that Harry lives with a lot of handicaps in his life, or, but they're not his fault. They're things he's going to, um, that he's, he's, he's going to deal with. He, he's under a lot of pressure. He's got all these terrible things in his life. He didn't cause them, but he is going to surmount them. Yeah. Um, so like Monk? Monk. Monk has a great handicap. Yeah. Um, and you can kind of look at these handicaps as external and internal. Monk has an internal one. He has, um, he has a, a, a certain psychology. It's not his fault that he has a weird brain chemistry. But he works with it and uses it in a really cool way. Harry, it's not his fault that his, his uncle and aunt are awful people. It's something he has to live with. Um, they don't stop being awful people. But this is a thing Harry works with through the course of the stories and, and surmounts. Um, doesn't get rid of, but surmounts. So you can, you can look at handicaps in all these different ways. They can be things put upon you externally. They can be internal. They can be things like your family that you love that, that can be taken advantage of that you don't want the character to get rid of. These are all problems that the characters are going to have to deal with in one way or another. It's weird to call them problems, but kind of get beyond that that the initial gut instinct of that word and look at what I mean. Does that make sense? This is one of those baking things, right? Cooks versus chefs. Questions about this idea? All right, yeah. Can a handicap also like, be helpful to the character? Yeah, totally can. 
Monk is a great example. Uh, Monk's handicap is also kind of what makes him interesting, and it serves him very well. Uh, you could say that Harry Potter's handicap, in part, is being a, raised by muggles. But having been raised by muggles, there are several points during the series where he knows things that, he, that people around him wouldn't know because of his upbringing. So, um, let's quickly talk about some other ways that people design characters um, that will help you out, hopefully. Some other tools. Um, and if you want to go into depth on those sliding scales more, I believe we did a writing excuses on each one, didn't we? So there's a 20-minute podcast where you get some different perspectives from what just <coughs> I said. What? There's only 15 minutes? What's that? Well, they're supposed to be 15. Are they ever 15? <laughs> no, they're not really ever 15. That's the joke. Okay. So another method that a lot of people like is what we call the dossier method. The dossier method um, is where you develop over time a list of questions that you ask yourself about every character that you're going to write. Um, and you have to target these questions at yourself. If you're looking for the questions you can ask that provoke the sort of deep understanding of that character that you want to have. Okay? So I can't give you a dossier. I can give you some sample questions that people like to ask um, about their characters, but I can't necessarily give you the dossier that'll work for you. It can be things such as, what's their favorite food? When was their first kiss? Um, you know, what kind, of, um, what kind of attributes do they admire? What would they like to have in life? What is their fondest desire and why can't they have it? What's their favorite animal? You know, what jobs have they had in the past? Uh, all of these sorts of things that you develop this sort of list, and the idea is to have a structured brainstorm for yourself where you start listing all of these things off, and that gets you spinning and just figuring out who this character is over time. You can Google and find dossiers online that various writers use. Uh, it's actually a very common method. I've mentioned Dan's method. Dan, uh, one of my writer friends, he likes to do a monologue from a character before he starts writing them. Now, Dan is mostly a discovery writer. So this is a way, if looking at all these sliding scales and stuff and you're a discovery writer, you're like, I just want to start writing my story and see who they are. Well, doing a monologue is very useful. But the monologue should be directed, usually. The best monologues are things where they're maybe answering a few important questions from a dossier. You know, what is your great passion in life? Can you tell me about it? Oh, my great passion in life is, you know, whatever. For Dan's first character he did this with, it was serial killers. And he creeped us all out. Um, <laughs> and he thought that was good, so he wrote a whole series about it. What is the character uh, I'm passionate about? Um, a way to look at characters in this way, particularly if you're going to try one of these, uh, these monologues, you should be asking yourself, okay, before the story begins, and the plot, like a freight train, smashes into our character, picks them up, and carries them to Topeka, because um, important things happen there, I'm sure. Before that happens, who is this character? What would they have done with their life? What are they passionate about? Where are they going? What, who are they other than the train? When you run into flat characters in a book, it's almost always because the character is built to suit the story. They're built, built they, they've, got like little, they've got like a hook for the train to catch them, right? And they're standing there waiting for that train to come along. And there's nothing about them other than them waiting for the train. You'll read these characters, and the question is, yeah, but who are they? What do they want? Why are they going along with this? Um, and this will dig into uh, the next time we talk about character. I'll start digging into this idea of character motivation. Character motivation, when you're writing characters, is probably the single most important thing that you can have for this character is their motivation. If you can nail their motivation in their voice, you will probably have a great character. At least a character readers will read and never feel that they don't understand who this character is or what they want in life. Now, we've got a few minutes left. Let's do some application. Um, one of the other methods that I've heard for designing a character 
is to ask yourself one simple question. Why don't they fit the role that they've been put in? In fact, uh, Dave, when he taught this class, he said that's his primary tool for developing a character. It's, you know, he's building a plot, he's thinking about a story, he's like, all right, who doesn't belong in this role in order to create some conflict? And then he puts the worst person he can think of to be in that role in that role. So why don't you guys give me, give me three, so raise, with a ra raise your hand, I'll call on you. Give, I want you a standard character trope of some sort. All right? Mentor. All right, you've got the wise mentor. Okay. All right. Uh, another standard character trope. Funny sidekick. Okay, funny sidekicks. All right, what's our last one? Kyle. Uh, loyal best friend. Okay, loyal best friend. Who may or may not be gay, because they often are. <laughs> um, all right, all right, so, Let's go with each of these. I'm going to call on three different people. I want you to put them in a role in the story that is a different trope. Okay? So let's pick a different trope from the story. A story that these characters would normally be in. Why the wise mentor. Let's put them in a different role. Oh. The villain. The wise mentor is the antagonist. Yeah. Ooh. Already, you should be like, wow. I, okay, all right, over here, sitting down. Uh, the muscle man? The funny sidekick is also the muscle. Not the little wrestling, lot toy wrestlers, but muscle. Uh, sorry. Does anyone even, yeah, I'm like 40. I used to play with muscle man. There's no 40 year olds in here but me, right? Am I the, oh, an Earl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, when I first taught this class, there were people older than me in the class, quite a number of them. Uh, nowadays, that doesn't happen anymore. Uh, all right, where are we going to stick the loyal best friend? What, what's, the, what's the archetype? Oh, yeah. I, what's that? Chosen one. The loyal best friend is the chosen one. Okay. Okay. So, already you can kind of see how this would start working, where you're mismatching mismatch, these. I look at this and say, okay, the wise mentor. You know, you write this fantasy story where the wise mentor is the antagonist. You can actually combine these in one. And there's a chosen one, and the wise mentor qu quietly poisons them. And the chosen one dies in chapter 5. And the loyal best friend that you thought was just going to be along for the ride has to pick it up and go fulfill what the chosen one was going to, even though they don't fit that role at all. That's an interesting story. You could make that a comedy. You could make that a drama. That's really interesting. When you start to force yourself to say, you know what, the best characters are these fish out of water and don't fit. But you, you can go further, okay? You can start developing these things. Uh, the wise mentor, let's do for all three of these. Um, they have an unusual profession. All right? Unusual profession. I want you to think of one. I'm going to call on you. Raise your hand. All right, what's the unusual profession? Mortician. Okay, the wise mentor is a mortician. <laughs> I'm not even sure how to spell that. Mortician. Yeah, there we go, mortician. Yes. Pineapple care. The funny side cat sells pineapples. Okay, and the loyal best friend. I'm gonna go way in the back. He's a lawyer. A lawyer. Okay. All right. Wait, that's not impossible. They're not loyal anyway. <laughs> now, 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 now. It's the 99% of lawyers that give the 1% the bad name. Um, so, let me ask you another one. We're kind of going in the dossier method. Um, some people really like to do this where they brainstorm with friends. Um, and sometimes these things go out completely off the rails. Sometimes they, they give you some interesting ideas. The goal is not to actually write one of these characters, but to kind of to get yourself thinking. So, what's the deep, dark secret in each of these characters' lives that they wouldn't like other people to know? All right? And raise your hand when you got one. All right, wise mentors, deep dark secret. He failed an IQ test. He failed an IQ test. Okay, uh, give me another one. I'm gonna have you keep going. No, you already did one. Come on. Well, I know you already did one. Don't do it. Give me a new one. Someone who hasn't raised their hand in the, over there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he's afraid of dead people. Afraid of dead people. <laughs> I like that.
Okay, okay. Funny sidekick, deep dark secret, somebody who hasn't given me one yet, go for it. Uh, maybe he did steroids in high school. Oh, yeah. <laughs> steroids, which may or may not have two R's, but in here it does. <laughs> yeah. For the lawyer, he failed the bar. He failed the bar, so he's not a real lawyer. Okay. <laughs> That's why he's st still a nice guy. <laughs> He failed the part that says, if you were going to screw over these people, how would you do it? Um, I'm joking. I have friends that are attorneys. Um, OK. So we start doing things like this, and you start to kind of build upon one another. So you've got the funny sidekick. Uh, the funny sidekick, ha ha, um, was tired of being Ron Weasley right? in high, in, in high school and said, I'm going to do steroids. I'm going to stop people from picking on me and just laughing at me, did steroids, became the muscle. I don't know if the pineapples fit in, so this happens. Um, but you can see how this character suddenly has a backstory and suddenly becomes more interesting. Um, we have a confidence for them in that, that now they're, they're, much, they're strong, but they also have a flaw in that they rely upon an external source for their, the source of their strength. Um, and so suddenly this character, these things are filling out just from a simple brainstorm. You've got the wise mentor. You've got Gandalf the murderer. Um, <laughs> but maybe this idea is that uh, the wise mentor knows something that we don't, that uh, the chosen one's power is to become uh, you know, a necromancer. And it's like, I, I can't deal with the, the dead rising again. Um, <laughs> I just gotta, I just gotta stop this right now. Um, or you know, the, the loyal best friend um, in the courtroom drama who has to step up and, um, and and argue the case by himself, even though the one who was the hotshot lawyer that everyone thought was gonna be able to do it, he can't do it. He's got to do it for his friend, but he's not a real lawyer. <laughs> he didn't pass the bar. Um, you, there, there's these things that you can build characters out of. The, the thing that you're looking for, and you'll notice what I was looking for here, is we are looking for the conflict. And that should kind of rule everything about this discussion. Once you've got this feel of, OK, this is the role I kind of want the character to be in, but this is why they don't fit it. This is who they would be if the plot never came this way. This is where they're, what they're good at. This is what they're bad at. Then you start asking yourself, what is their conflict? Um, where are they going to move on those sliding scales? Or what, how are they going to overcome this flaw? Uh, what about them needs to change through the course of the story? And I would suggest that all of the best characters do change in some way across the course of their story, with the significant exception of the Superman stories, not Superman himself, but stories about those, where you, part of the whole idea is the static character who's very good at everything. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the, like, Miss Marple stories by um, Agatha Christie didn't have huge character arcs because they were about a hyper competent person trying to solve a crime. Uh, Hercule Perot was the same way. So, but there were little character arcs here and there. Once you've got these things, ask yourself, what goes wrong in their life? Why can't they have what they want? And start working on that conflict. And you will start to have characters that are going to look really good and work really well. Next time, probably not next week, in a few weeks, we'll talk about character motivations and how to use viewpoint to make them characterize. Thank you, guys. Turn in your shit. Slips. <laughs> Can't say that word at BYU.